Oh, oh, Sheila. Wait a minute. I've been singing that lately. I don't know why. It's like stuck in my head. Then an eighties mood. Yeah, like just eighties music. It's weird. I love eighties music. I love everything eighties. Yeah, I, I think we have experience with the eighties, Wale. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, so it's the Booze and BJJ podcast. This is Thomas. I can't find my microphone. I don't know what's going on. Once again, I'm lost on a Friday night with my rum and purple drink and my good buddy, Wale. What's up? Wale, sir. How's your week going? What you drinking? I am actually, hold on, let me get my mood light in on here. There we go. Uh, it's been a so so week, like for training. Um, I only got to train like, what did I get to train? I got to train one day a week this week. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, today I'm drinking water because it is hot outside and I need to drink this to survive. Stay hydrated, folks. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually cheating. I've got like 99% purple drink and uh, like 1% rum. Uh, like a splash of rum. Like a splash of rum. Technically still a drink. But uh, yeah, I'm cheating tonight. But uh, for me, uh, training this week was interesting. Because uh, there was a new guy over at Chantilly. Uh-huh. didn't speak english very well very nice 21 years old apparently he's like high uh, high ranked judoka in mongolia uh-huh. that got real interesting like we we had a pretty good uh role like our sparring session was was just it was eye-opening it, it was it was interesting to see the contrast between a 21 year old uh judoka on the ground versus my old self on the ground. So has, has he never trained jiu-jitsu or has he trained a little bit? What what rank was he? So I think he's technically a white belt in jiu-jitsu or he should be blue. Um, I think he's he's only been in the U.S. about two weeks, I believe. So okay. his jiu-jitsu training has been limited to his time in the U.S. So he hasn't trained jiu-jitsu much, but his nuaza was smooth and it, it it was actually pretty good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I am. Um, I, so judo was closed for, I guess they closed for Memorial Day last Sunday. I, it kind of sucked because I was like kind of looking forward to a whole, my, I planned out my judo and my jiu-jitsu schedule. <clears throat> Stuff came up and everything just fell apart and it made me sad. It was a sad week. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I gotta. Uh, I gotta start seriously focusing on the, you know, like the first eight throws. To um, you know, seriously learn those. So hopefully, whatever testing's next, try to test for my green belt. So what are the? It, it's been years. What are the first eight throws? I'm I'm curious to see if they've changed that uh, um, criteria. Let me look. I know, I know there's uh, sort of Gary Ogoshi. Uh, what else? I should know this. <laughs> hey, are you like secretly quizzing me on this? No, I'm. I'm just genuinely uh, uh-huh. curious. Also, your your uh-huh. camera went out. Yeah, because I'm looking up the the first eight throws. Okay. As for us, it was um, Osotogari, uh, Fireman Carry, which I don't think is done anymore, uh, Hip Throw, yeah. um, there's another variation, a Headlock Throw, Shoulder Throw, and like one or two others. I don't even know if they do a Headlock so, Throw anymore. So... Uh, let's see. It's 
Osotogare Deashibare, but Deashibaria, Deashibare. Uh, Deashibare? Yeah, sorry, Deashibare. He's a Gurame. Say that uh, again? He's a Gurama. It's the wheel throw. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, then the, I had a, and then Uku, Ukugoshi, Ogoshi, Serenage, uh, Moroto Serenage, and Ochi Gari, and one more. Yeah. You're muted. Dang it, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, but funny thing, on Tuesday, Sugi showed a, a specific suicide throw. And that's what I did with the that judo crowd I just told you about. Yeah. And I did it pretty decently. And, and it was a variation of something I learned years ago. So it was not unfamiliar. Yeah. Uh, he taught it again Thursday. And he showed it again Thursday. And for the life of me, I couldn't get it right. Yeah. And it was it was just one of those bizarre moments where I was sitting there thinking, what is what is wrong with me today? You know, I did it perfect pretty much as best as I could do it. I'm not gonna say perfect, but I did it pretty well on Tuesday. And it's the same freaking throw. Like, why can't I do it right now? And I figured it out at the end of class what I was doing wrong. So oh. I was a little embarrassed. What were you doing wrong? So you have to, you had to turn your opponent as you started falling to the ground. Mm -hmm. So you grab his sleeve and his lapel by the back of the neck mm -hmm. and you turn him so that you both are, your both of your heads are simultaneously going to one direction at the same time. And then you fall to your back, you put your foot on the, your opponent's hip and he uses momentum to to flip him over onto his back. It's like the over, the way you flip him over, yeah, not instead sideways. Of, instead of going over your head, he'll go at an angle like a 45 degree angle over your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen Sugi do that quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Uh, I know Isaac likes, uh, he, he likes to do a lot of those suicide throws. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like to do similar ones, but they usually mm. involve like doing like a, a butterfly hook behind the knee as you as you start dropping. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I I like them, but I just you know, a lot of basically judo throws are commitment, and uh, but suicide throws are extra commitment because you have to you have to trust that you're gonna follow through, also you're just gonna get smashed. Yes. Um, the thing is that one little tweak that I found out that I wasn't doing on uh, Thursday that I was doing on Tuesday, I realized that that was my problem with the butterfly hook variations that I've been doing previously. Like the ones that failed, I wasn't off balancing my opponent. And, yeah. you know, I, you know, as I think back, as I think back, as I think at the back about it, you know, <laughs> The ones that I did pull off pretty well is when I added some more off balancing, some more kazushi. So, yeah, yeah it, it was it was an overall learning experience. It's like amazing how like you could do, be doing something for a long time, and then start failing at it, and then you see like one minor little detail, and then you, you remember, discover. Yeah, it's like oh, that's what I was doing before, <laughs> but I'm not doing it now. Yeah. 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 Sorry, people are texting me questions. It's kind of weird. It's like, why aren't you just asking uh, me on Twitch? Like, go ahead. All right. So you want to get into questions? Um, yes. So somebody te texted me asking since uh, they were, you know, we're talking about judo and jiu-jitsu, of course. Mm -hmm. They were asking, at what point would you start learning judo? Would you learn that mm -hmm. after you do jiu-jitsu? Or before? Mm. Uh, I have an answer, but um, what do you think? 
mean, I think there's, I don't think there's any wrong time to learn. Um, I, the thing is, I think that there, there is enough, there's a lot of similarity between the two, but they're also very dissimilar that like, you know, if you learn one before the other, it's not like you're going to mess one up or, you know, it's not like if you learn judo before jujitsu, it's not like you're going to, uh, mess up or it's not like you're going to have a hard time learning jujitsu because you're kind of in a judo frame of mind um i think but you know saying that i think probably it, it i think it depends on what your goal is like if your goal is to do competitions and you know that's your goal then i would say probably judo before jujitsu just because it's like you know you need to <clears throat> you need to get that, you know, stand-up game, and that's like essential. Um, if you're not really into competitions, you know, then you know you could do either one, but probably like just jujitsu, since uh, because jujitsu has some stand-up. But yeah, I think it really depends on the goal. No, I, I agree with you. Um, I will add one thing though. Like our, our answers to a point are very similar, except for what I'm going to add now. Um, if you're going to learn judo, learn it before you start wearing out your knees. Yeah, that's and true. That's the, uh, the, the old man, uh, answer. <laughs> old, old man advice. It's the old man advice. Cause, uh, I actually learned judo first and I learned it 15, 16 years before I started jujitsu. But when I started jujitsu, I realized that that skill set was still applicable to a degree, but I couldn't do a lot of the techniques, a lot of the throws that I had learned because they hurt my knees. So, yeah, like, honestly, for anybody who wants to learn judo and then transition to jujitsu or, you know, vice versa, whichever, you know, not sure which one to start with. I would literally say it depends on how your the what you want to do, like while they discussed. That's part one. Part two is how good are your knees? Because yeah, yeah, like once you start, once your knees start hurting, it's going to become significantly harder and harder for you to execute a, a lot of judo techniques. Yeah. And I mean, I think even if you're heavy into jujitsu, even a little bit of judo is helpful because it's it teaches you a lot of safety. So it's just like teaches you how to fall properly, how to scramble back up, you know, a bunch of things like that. But yeah, you because know, I think a lot of people are afraid of getting thrown. So that's why they don't do judo. But, you know, a proper um, a proper training partner will make sure that you fall safely and, you know, will make sure that you 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 don't get hurt while you're um, while you're training. So it really builds up your confidence in terms of, you know, knowing that you can one, take someone down and knowing that two, you know, if you fall, you'll fall properly and you, you know how to get right back up. And honestly, so, go ahead. Yeah. No, yeah. So again, I, I think it really depends on, on your goal. If you're more um, like competition focused, then you, you definitely want to start out doing judo earlier. But if you're not so much competition focused, then, you know, you could do judo anytime, you know, doing, doing your training, I think. Of course. But even, even from, honestly, and this is something that I've noticed, even from like a, a, a martial arts perspective, one could also think of judo as one half of, of the complete, of a complete art where they focus on the standing portion and then jujitsu yeah. is the other half that focuses on the ground portion. Yeah. So that that's the way that I think about it, and you know they're good complementary com, complementary uh, art uh, martial yeah. arts in themselves. So, so the other question, which is something that I was thinking about <laughs> after a conversation earlier this week, was actually about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. and I know we talked about this a little bit before, but um, a friend of mine recently just got his blue belt. And of course, he's going to remain anonymous. Uh, but he was saying that he felt uh, as if he was still a white belt 
because mm -hmm. a, a lot of the bigger and stronger white belts were still giving him a, a really hard time. Mm -hmm. So because of that, he feels like he isn't deserving of it. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you yeah. think? So I think that the only person that knows whether or not you're deserving of a belt is your coach. If your coach puts that belt on you, you deserve it, regardless of what you you might yourself might think. And, you know, that's somebody, that's something that somebody, uh, I think I heard that somewhere or someone told me about that. Um, I think also it's like being that he just moved to being a blue belt. When you become blue belt, I think especially when you become blue belt, everyone's gunning for you. You know, you got the white belts are gunning for you, you know, to try and prove a point. The purple belts are gunning for you to put you in your place. So it's going to be a rough couple of months, you know, because everyone's coming after you. So you may feel that you are, that you're having a, a harder time, but I think it's more so because people are basically, you put you on, on the hit list, you know. And I mean, I think when I, I felt a little bit of that imposter syndrome when I when I went from white to blue. Um, it just feels like, you know, it feels like you've gone to a point where, okay, you know a little bit of jujitsu, but then you kind of open up this whole new world of being a blue belt, and you're like, oh crap, I don't, I really don't know anything, and yeah. So I think it's it's natural to feel that way. But I like I was saying, like it, it's it's whatever your coach says. If if your coach thinks you deserve a blue belt or deserve whatever belt you have on, then that's what you deserve. And it's um it's interesting. The coach that I'm with now, he made a, an interesting point. He said he you know he told me yeah you know, obviously as a black belt he's like there's no difference between me and you that you know even you as a blue as a blue belt and him as a black belt the only difference is is timing and having that experience that you know you know having that experience of timing and knowing you know when to time your attacks and to time your defenses and that sort of thing and i thought that was an interesting point yeah i, I remember when i got my blue belt and everybody at white belt, and I think it was oh, not very many blue belts at the time at, at Pentagon. Um, everybody who was a white belt who I had pretty good roles with, and even the ones that I, you know, would just have like a good clean role with, they all just started going after my head like I was some sort of, you know, like I, I, I had a bounty on it or something. It was yeah. like, yeah, like what, what changed between you know yesterday when i put this blue belt on and the week before when i was still a white belt because i'm the same yeah. dude like what is what's happening here and you yeah know, everyone's yeah everyone's gunning for you you know you know i thought it was like just some sort of like initiation period like hazing period but mm -hmm. these folks did not let up on the gas and i'm thinking do they know that i'm like 10 15 years older than them <laughs> this isn't cool <laughs> But, you know, after I got used to it. So, you know, after a while, it was like good fun and games. But, you know, it, it did cause me to feel some way about it because I was thinking, well, if they're giving me such a hard time now, even though they're going harder, like, did I, did I really earn this belt, you know? But you were right. And I think somebody, I think I either read it somewhere or I heard it somewhere on YouTube. You know, if your coach puts a belt on your waist, you've earned it. You know, and additionally, you know, there, I think it was like one of the, uh, one of the Gracie uh, brothers who's floating around YouTube, I forget which one it is, but he was talking about Boyd's belts, where like every 10 pounds, like every 10 years or every 10 pounds is like an extra belt on, belt ranking for you. So if you're, you know, 50, a 50 year old blue belt and some guys like a, you know, 20 year old purple belt for example like you're gonna have a rough time yeah 
So, yeah, you, you know, my, my advice though about like imposter syndrome, anybody who feels like they have it is just keep going to class. Whether you have imposter syndrome or not, whether you feel some way about it or not, just keep going. You know, if you're if you're a purple belt and you're worried about the super athletic, you know, former D1 wrestler white belt submitting you, you know, he's he's a super athletic former D1 wrestler. Like, what 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 more will you would you need to go toe to toe with that guy? Because most people aren't going to be able to. Yeah, I, I think it's it's you know. It goes back to you have to remember what you why you got into the sport in the first place. Did you get into smash everyone? You know, because that's that's a short lived career. You're not you're not going to be able to smash everyone. Or did you get into it because you love the sport and you want to be in it in it long term? You know, so that's that's more of a realistic goal. So you know, I think you got to. Yeah, uh, just remember why you got into the sport, and you know if you're, you you may have to like reevaluate where you are, or you may have to scale back on on your training, or increase your training, or something like that. Yeah, you know, just focus on skill acquisition. That's that's the main yeah. piece of advice I tell people. Whatever, however you feel, positive, negative, and different, just show up, learn something new. Yeah, just keep it, keep doing that. Just very simple. Yeah. I wonder if that's why a lot of blue belts quit. So I think it's because people make an artificial goal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then they get to that goal and then they have nothing else to focus on. Yeah. You know, I think for a number of people I, I know who quit a little bit after or even a bit a bit after getting their blue belt at blue belt wait a few of the people i know who are blue belts who quit that seems to have been a common factor between all of them like they were belt they probably didn't know it outright but they, they were belt chasing you know effectively yeah yeah so, when i get my blue belt what do i have to do to get my blue belt blue belt blue yeah, belt sure. i've been a white belt for a year and a half oh my god get her done you know it's like calm down yeah i mean i think i think there's a lot of i think there's a lot of that when you start out as a white belt because you don't really you, there's a lot of belt chasing but chasing the wrong belt if you know what i mean so it's like you're chasing a blue belt as opposed to you know chasing a black belt and understanding that getting to that final goal is is you know is a long-term journey kind of thing yeah you know yeah yeah i never really i, I didn't really think of jujitsu as like a, a hard you know yeah. goal-oriented type of thing you know <laughs> when i got my blue belt i was like sweet cool yeah when's open mat you know it, it, it was yeah. you know it was an accomplishment but you know, it, it wasn't like a goal for me. And I think yeah. it, it it definitely seems like a lot of the blue belts who have quit that we know, you know, they made blue belt a goal. And once they got yeah. it, you know, I, I assume that all of their interest in training kind of just faded. Yeah. I mean, I've been a blue belt for um, something like three, four years now. But it's just like, you know, I'm more focused on just training and enjoying the training. And, you know, I think also competitions help too. You know, it's, you kind of get in between your belts, you you kind of have something to focus on tr what you're training for, basically. <laughs> so not just like focusing on training to uh I want to train and then eventually get my blue belt, but just, you know, Hey, I want to train, do competitions. And, you know, that levels up your skill quickly. And, you know, it also gives you recognition that, you know, your, your instructors will see that, you know, you're competing and hopefully winning or, or just, you know, just even competing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, here's another question moving on. Mm -hmm. um 
So hold on a second. Yeah, that's not a good one. The question got into us into troll. I think some of these are troll questions. Like, yeah. This one just asked me what spats I wear and if I wear anything underneath them. That's not a troll question. I mean, it, it's like basically asking me what underwear I'm wearing. Like, it's weird. Well, you know, do you have maybe, you know, maybe they're like, oh, I'm about the same size as you. What I wonder what's going to be comfortable on me. True, but, you know, people don't understand. Yeah. I am curvy. So, unless they're curvy. It, too. It, they only see the top half of you. They don't see all those curves. <laughs> I am packing some lovely Tommy lumps. Uh, I, I I don't really do nogi a lot, but I do like the um, inverted gear stuff. So like the the gis are pretty good, and I just started wearing their like nogi stuff, and it's pretty cool because they have the the spats and then the, the shorts. They're both attached together, so you don't. I mean, if you want, you don't have to really wear anything under that, or you know, just wear underwear. I hope I hope most people are wearing underwear. <laughs> so uh, at No Gi today, I actually found a pair of shorts that fit. Excuse me, fit me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tore the tag off it, and now I have to go back on Amazon and find the freaking brand again. Yeah, because I don't remember what it's called. All I have is their logo. All right, what so like? uh, they're they're plain black. They don't have Velcro on the front, and there's like a no, the logo. It's like a white circle with a, a white line underneath it i think it might be uh the brand might be gold something That's, um, i thought that was i think it's gold it's not, something it's not show your roll is it i don't i don't buy show your roll uh nogi stuff really <laughs> so i do have another question from a viewer so it's coming in through Facebook again, but uh, uh -huh. to complement your grappling, what other type of martial art do you supplement it with? Oh, um, so what they're asking is, along with our jujitsu, mm -hmm. what other martial art? Do we supplement our jujitsu with? Like, you know, uh, how, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, how Nogi guys mostly mm -hmm. do most the time. Stuff, huh? Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny for me, like, it's, uh, I unfortunately don't have a lot of time to do other martial arts. I would love to. Um, but it's just like, if I do another martial art that takes time away from jiu-jitsu and I, I just don't have like a, a bunch of time. If I did have a bunch of time, uh, I would take Boy Thai definitely because they're, you know, not necessarily for, you know, it doesn't really translate to jiu-jitsu because in terms of like, there's no direct translation because it's, you know, stand up and more punching and hits and stuff like that. And uh, jiu-jitsu is grappling, but it does help with the cardio. And it does help with, you know, the explosiveness and, you know, the the muscle endurance, definitely. Because, like, I was taking Muay Thai and Jiu-Jitsu for a while together. And I did notice, you know, I had a lot more, I had a lot more endurance, you know. It, it was just, it was pretty crazy. I had a bunch of energy and a lot more endurance. And that definitely helped with my you know with my grappling um yeah i mean i think muay thai and you know probably wrestling too just for the for the sake of you know it's another grappling sport so and that probably uh applies more directly mm -hmm. Mute. Thomas, you're on mute. Damn it. <laughs> you gotta start all over again. No, I think the, the, 
so the mute only affects um, Zoom. So the Twitch folks heard heard me. Um, yeah, so I supplement my uh, grappling, my BJJ, with um, with a little bit of judo and a little bit of wrestling, but I supplement my grappling period with uh, boxing and some Ishin Ryu karate mixed in. Uh, I did Ishin Ryu years ago, but I find a lot of the a lot of the hand techniques and a lot of the the stances um, would would fit. they're a good supplement to to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because uh -huh. not only do you get like some uh, fighting techniques when you're on your feet, you know, you get some striking and you also get, uh, some balancing techniques. Like, I don't know if you, you notice, but when I roll and I'm playing the top position, if somebody is trying to do something fancy from open guard or trying to sweep me, I drop into a low horse stance or a sumo squat. And like, like it's, it's a good foundation for a good, uh, for good base when you're, when you're rolling. Yeah. So I found that to be pretty cool. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in a concept from, you know, one of those other arts and, and try to see if it applies somewhere in BJJ. And, it, and I've, I've met some success with it. So yeah, that works out pretty yeah. well. I think, I think anything that helps with your endurance would definitely help, with, you know, any martial art or any sort of cross training that helps with your endurance because a lot of BJJ, it's, you know, you're explosive and then it slows down and then explosive and slows down. So it's kind of like a back and forth, almost like a hit workout. So anything yeah. that puts you in that state is, uh, I think it's helpful. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, the only martial, there's two specific martial arts that I probably would not recommend to supplement jujitsu. But um, number one is Aikido, mm -hmm. and number two is uh, there's a style of kung fu, but I won't specifically say what it is because I I don't think you can find it in the, in the, the East Coast anymore right now. But that that was that did not pair well with judo, so I don't think it would pair well with yeah. um, jujitsu either. I mean, Aikido has a lot of you know. Um, joint manipulation stuff and I mean, I, yeah, I mean I don't see it as a direct you know complement to it but you may be able to get some of that wrist manipulation stuff and you know joint manipulation stuff yeah I, just... I don't I don't think it's applicable overall but you know maybe you might be able to get a couple of small elements from it and apply that yeah i mean you're always going to be able to find small elements in one style and sure. apply it to another sure. yeah but like like the to yeah. complement it uh i don't know yeah yeah maybe, uh, maybe. Uh, go ahead uh -huh. no i was gonna say like gouging people's eyes you could take that from uh what's it called crab maga the, yeah from crab maga mm -hmm. <laughs> But um, I was about to say I was about to say something about crap, but it's fine. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see what other topics were on the table here. Hold on one second. Oh, got one. So I forget who it was, but they sent us in our little group a video of a guy getting choked out with his own belt. Oh yeah. Was that his own belt or was it the his opponent's belt? I don't know, but I mean, if it's his opponent's belt, that's just disrespectful <laughs> to choke yeah. someone else, someone out with with their own belt. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I haven't heard that it's illegal. I mean, I I think I've seen it maybe once or twice before that video. Um, yeah, I mean, what if, if the rest not stopping it then? And it's you're obviously doing that technique. It's not like you're trying to be sneaky. The rest not stopping it, then it's not illegal. Yeah, I just I I, I don't know if the rest. I don't know if it's just kind of it just seems kind of like a dick move, but you know. 
See, my thing is, I don't know if the ref saw it. I mean, he had to, you know. Well, at the end, he did because he stopped it, right? He still had the belt belt around the guy's neck. Oh, you're right. When the when the ref, ref stopped it, so yeah, yeah, I got you. I mean, I mean, and if the ref didn't see that, you know, it was it was super obvious that the ref didn't see that, then that's not a good ref. So the thing is, yeah. this kind of segues into uh, a conversation I had with someone. If mm-hmm. folks are allowed to use a belt to strangle you. Yeah. Um, and people are wrapping up their limbs with people's lapels, a la like worm guard, for example. Mm-hmm. Like it brings to question, you know, like how the, the efficacy of these mar- not the eff- that the efficacy of the rule set. Because if you think about it, if someone takes off their belt and starts strangling someone else with it, wouldn't that be kind of assault with a with a weapon to a degree? I mean, because well, you know you're you're intentionally taking off your belt in order to apply a strangle on someone else. I mean, then you, you could you could also make the argument that you know strangling somebody, rear naked choke, and all that stuff is still intent with a weapon because it's just you're not using you're using your hands as a weapon, which is you know. You're using your arms as a weapon, which you could argue the same case, I think. Yeah, I I think you're right. At the end of the day, for me personally, I wouldn't strangle someone with my own belt or their belt in a competition just because it's, I mean, it's unorthodox, but uh, at the same time, I think it's kind of a dick move and it kind of blurred. I I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying. It blurs the lines between the sport and what you might find out there, you know, on the street or whatever. Yeah. You know, if I'm in, yeah, if I'm in a fight, yeah, I'll, and someone's trying to like hurt me, yeah, I'll take their belt off and strangle, and like, you know, choke them with their own belt. You know, oh, all, yeah. Yeah. So it's just, you know, when, if you're doing that in competition, then there's, um, yeah, it kind of blurs the lines between sport and something that you you'll find out there that has no rules, you know. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? I forget. But no, like, I don't know if 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 using someone's if using someone's belt or your own belt to to apply a choke is is considered a legit move. Yeah. Are you still there? Yeah. Why not? Uh, I mean, because you're, you're. I think it depends on the nuance. Like, if someone intentionally takes their belt off and then applies a strangle, I could see that being, you know, someone using a weapon. But if someone, uh-huh. if they're like, you know, chest to chest, for example, and then they they loosen their belt up to apply something, I think that's a little bit. Different. Yeah. I mean, but you, you can't unintentionally strangle someone with a belt right it, it's oh. a very intentional move right no i mean like uh you know for example someone i think intentionally removing the belt to apply a strangle that that's a better way uh, as opposed to the person's belt being loose and like just getting loose to... and then like they're still in close contact and then they apply it. i think i'm not articulating this point very well, but I think that there's a difference. It's like a new it's like the nuance between self-defense and non-self-defense. Well, at the end of the day, you're still strangling one with a belt. You know, that's that's the intentional act. I I, I have a point here, but I'm too tired to like flush it out. So it's kind of like, you know, somebody taking a gun and shooting someone versus it was just laying out there. So there are nuances with that, though. Mm. That there are nuances with. Like, if you get into a confrontation, leave 
get the gun, then come back and then shoot the person. Yeah. You're you committed a felony. Yeah. Or uh you know, for example, if what was the other one? Oh, warning shots. Like if you shoot a warning shot at someone. Uh, yeah, that also is that's also illegal. But the, these are things that people do that when they think they're um actually uh defending themselves like uh, in the appropriate way. But it's like, well, no, you 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 did this incorrectly. You know, like uh, in the in the first example, it had somebody been in a conference like a situation and had their gun on them and then drawn it and then used it, then they'd be in the clear. But you know, the one thing that people don't understand. And I'm going to try to tie this into the belt thing. If you get into a situation where you need your gun and then you leave and then come back, that's illegal because you've removed yourself from the situation and then intentionally retrieved your weapon and went back back into it. That, that, That doesn't fly. Now, if as I'm thinking about it, like if you're using, if someone is using their belt and because it went loose or something, and then they had some slack and then applied a choke. I feel like that's more, the way I view it, I feel like uh, I, that would be more of an acceptable usage of it versus just undoing your belt and then right. just putting it over someone's neck and then tightening it up like a like a noose. I feel so like that, it, becomes, it becomes sort of part of the gi because it's loosened up. Right. Mm. I don't know. I'm just theory crafting with it because I, I can see like, I can see belt strangles becoming an issue. But, you know, if you think about it, you know, people get choked out by, you know, other parts of the gi. Uh, Right. So how, you know, that's, the question is, should you be, then the question then is like, should you be using parts of your gi to, you know, choke people out? Because, you know, should, can you do like a clock choke? You know, <laughs> I, I think the difference is if your belt is loose, right? It's still somewhat attached to you. If you completely t- undo your belt and take it off, that becomes mm. a separate item. Like it's no longer attached to yeah. you or your gi. Do you but, see what I mean? I feel like there's. And so I, I kind of get what you mean. But let, let's say, you know, so you're rolling and you know, you you sprawl on someone and then your gi is fully, you know, you have your belt on your gi. I feel like it's kind of the same as if you go ahead and remove your gi from your belt and use that to choke someone, like clock choke or whatever, then that shouldn't be allowed versus if your gi was already loose, you can still choke them. I think the comparative situation would be if someone took their gi jacket off and then used that to choke someone. <laughs> I'd love to see that. Just like, <laughs> or or just take your gi jacket off, throw it over their head, and just like you know, tie it up until they pass out. <laughs> see now you're gonna you're gonna start seeing that happen. In we call this one the plastic bag over the head. We call this one the Scooby Doo. Where are you? No. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah. I think there's a nuance there, but I'm too tired to like, like flesh it out. Flesh it out. It, it just seems like if someone takes off an article of their key and then but, uses it to strangle someone, it seems like that would be a. a or should I, be yeah. A, that seems like you're intentionally creating a weapon to use against someone. Yeah. There's um, yeah, um, I I kind of get what you're saying. There, there's a certain level of intent when you actually take it off, versus if it's already there and you're in a scramble, blah blah blah, and you grab whatever you can grab to to finish on. So, anyways, yeah, let's let's move on to the next question. Couple of things. Yep. I do like these question and answer. Yeah, Ooh, I, we should I, have a we should have a ask me anything. I was trying to do that on Wednesdays, but mm-hmm. I've been too so swamped with work that 
like I, I really haven't been able to breathe much or do anything like i i thought i was done last week like i thought it was yeah. over yeah so, uh, how many how many are you up to now 200 are you are you faster 200 now for what your uh your work the 200 mark are you still on six what we were talking about the automation in the chat yeah oh oh no <laughs> So there's, I have to, I have to code 270 automation scripts. Yeah. I have done 15. Uh -huh. So they want them done soon. I don't know how that's going to yeah. work. No, it's not. No. But anyways, <laughs> um, moving on. Somebody's asking, have you ever drank too much before training? And if so, <laughs> How did you pull it off to the end? Uh, before I've drank a lot after training. I don't think I've drank a lot before training, but I have been very tired before training. So, you know, they say it's kind of the same thing. How do you pull it off? Now, is this like training where you're constantly rolling or is it like technique training? Technique training, you could probably, you know, get away with you know, doing it half-ass. They don't specify. But, they just say training. Yeah. But if you're actually training, you know, competition training, for example, where you're constantly rolling. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can even, I don't know if you can get past that one. Yeah, the competition training we did with Levi and Sugi. Yeah. Even though those were you, separate classes, you... You, you can't not, come to class drunk. <laughs> yeah. You, you could not have done that drinking in any way, yeah. shape, or form. No. No. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not something that I think is is feasible. Maybe if you had like yeah. one and it didn't really affect you, and then you went to go to like a normal class. Yeah. Maybe. But yeah, you're doing BJJ drunk is kind of not cool. Like. Especially if you risk throwing up on someone, just, just don't do it. Okay, yeah. No, because you got no. you got me on belly. Yeah, or, I or, mean, go ahead. Uh, oh, what? No, no, go ahead. Finish your thought. Oh no, I was gonna say also, you know, it's kind of like a drunken master kung fu style BJJ. So the closest thing I came to going to class, um, having drank too much was I had bought a new uh, cough syrup and decongestant that yeah. um, I had never tried it before, but I got it on a recommendation. And I, I drank the normal dosage, the recommended dosage, went to class, mm -hmm. and I regretted life. Like, yeah. it, that was not fun. And I, I checked, went and looked, and the uh, alcohol content and that stuff was kind of on the high side. Especially yeah, you're like Especially what? Especially since it, you know I, I don't really drink much, so. Mm. I mean, you're just asking for trouble if you go to class tipsy or drunk. Like yeah. you're saying, may, maybe one drink you might be fine. You might be able to kind of shake it off halfway through, but anything more than that, then you're just asking for a world world of hurt. Just asking for trouble. Yep. Yeah, if you gotta go train, just do it completely sober, just hydrate, eat, eat, oh, yeah. eat something reasonable. Other than that, don't do anything else. That's another thing that you know, especially moving into summer, folks have to remember to hydrate. You know, I'm I'm pretty bad at it, but you know, the last thing you want to do is pass out while you're rolling. So I was I was trying to be the nice guy and I went to Dollars on Monday for the Memorial Day open mat. Uh -huh. I brought bottles of water with me and kept them in my trunk. And uh -huh. when I put them in there, they were cold. So I forgot about them while we were rolling. And I went back in there. I was like, oh man, he's got a I got a cold uh cold bottle of water or, or two or three in there if I want it. Dude, uh -huh. they were they were warm and just not cold at all anymore like uh, i was like all right it can't be that warm so i tried to drink one and it was yeah it was awful it was like it was like, like drinking drink, tea it was like drinking like flavorless lukewarm tea 
Not even lukewarm tea, <laughs> but above lukewarm tea. It was terrible. So, um, let's stay do one hydrated. more. Yeah, just stay hydrated, folks. Yeah, don't don't drink and then go train jujitsu or anything else. Oh, and, if, and buy 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 a summer gi. And yeah, buy a summer gi. And just remember, if you throw up on me, I will not be happy. If you throw up on, no, I'm not even gonna make that joke. Anyways, so Wale, it is time to roast yeah. Mitt. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. where is he? He's at Dallas. Oh, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, Mitt is one of my favorite training partners, but also one of my most hated training partners. And would you like to know why, Wally, sir? Why is your favorite training partner? And also one of my most hated. Why? Because he is so pretty, he makes me look even uglier. Yes. And I'm like, dude, how are you so pretty? He's like standing around. He looks like a damn supermodel. <laughs> like, we need to bring him down a little bit. You gotta, you gotta, like, you know, when you're rolling with him, get that gi across his face. Get that gi burn. Yeah, gi burn but across he's, the face. He's, he, his skin is just so, you know, it's just so shiny and just luminous and that, you know, you try and do that, it just slides right off. But yeah, you know, look, look at his hair. It's like perfectly cut, like perfectly shaped. Yeah, every, every time. Every, every time. It's like, how do you maintain that? He could be rolling yeah. for like 40 minutes. He gets exactly. up his hair. Perfect. <laughs> like, how do you do that? I have no clue. Yeah. I mean, I'm not complaining because I don't really have much hair anymore. But <laughs> if I did have hair, I need to figure out what he's putting in it so I can like emulate that. But again, yeah. I have no hair. Speaking yeah, of- I can. My hair doesn't move like his, like, no matter what I do. True. True. Speaking of which, while I was thinking about growing my hair out and wearing it like a samurai knot, like back here. Uh, you better get a katana to go with that. I got several downstairs. I, I have a collection. I was actually going to get, there's a there's a guy on Etsy that, that custom makes them. And they're really? actually really nice. Yeah, for about 500 bucks. Wait, so he like blades with them or, you know? Yeah. He he forges the blades or whatever, whatever the process is. He makes the blades, he tempers them, uh, he heats up the metal and and fold, you know, pours it into a bar, folds, and folds it, and then you know, heats it up again. For, uh, for 500 it. bucks. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a steal, man. That's... Yeah, and there's options that you can use. Like you can customize the handle, you can customize the guard, you can choose which ones. A lot of mm. the pieces on the handle are are bronze, mm. so it's actually really cool looking. They look, they look pretty good on uh, and on Etsy. They look like they're pretty high quality. Mm. Um, I kind of want to order one and see if if they live up to yeah. what I saw. Yeah. So how do you sharpen those? Do you use like your your kitchen? You know the. <laughs> mine came yeah, with, what's mine came with a uh, kit and a stone to sharpen it with. Mm. Yeah, or or you get one of those things on as seen on TV. You know, with the you roll it through. So I had a client who was less than smart. Let's just say that. And he would always tell me, bring me stuff to fix. And he would always tell me some crazy story behind it. Mm-hmm. And one time he brought me, and I don't know why he did this because I never worked on appliances. One time he brought me a old uh, electric can opener that had two knife sharp- sharpening slots in the, in the back of it. And mm-hmm. he was like, the motor on my knife sharpener must have burnt out because when I go to turn it on, it doesn't do anything. Long story short, he had went and bought like uh, uh, a katana, and it was the blade was done. Uh, no. So he sharpened it with his freaking no. right. No. Yep. But uh, you so, know, uh, was, uh, the question is, how was this katana after that? Uh the the cutting <laughs> edge looked really weird with the way that the the with with the way that it was sharpened. But yeah, you know, it was okay, I guess. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm assuming somebody's shopping some. 
somewhere. Well, I don't know if you can take it to, you know, like a like a those blade knife sharpeners. But I doubt it. I don't know. I would. I mean, mine came with a, a sharpening kit, so mm-hmm. I used it once or twice, and it was it seemed to do seemed to fit fit the bill. So. Uh, Wally, I need to go to sleep. <laughs> I'm too tired. Yeah, yeah, me too. And I think this rum just made it worse. That's why you got hydro with water, man. It's summertime. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to do that. Um, yeah, like you know, when you have a chance, just come out to Chantilly if you want to do. Uh, no- I, yeah, I definitely want to. I want to make it a, a regular thing. I just need to figure out in, in my schedule because, you know, I, I still want to, you know, uh, roll with y'all and also take a couple of classes with Sugi and, you know, but I'll figure it out. It's most likely like open mat I'll come to. I don't know if I can make it to any of the classes. Yeah, open mat's always fine. But one of the classes. Uh, you, the adults classes start at 7 Monday, Wednesday, Friday. On Monday and Wednesday, it's Muay Thai than No Gi. And then Tuesday, Thursday is the Big Gi class. Tuesday, Thursday. All right. Yeah. Monday, Wednesday. Wait, what about Friday? Oh, Friday is um, No Gi. At, no, it's No Gi at uh, 7. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's it. The Friday class is actually interesting. Okay, well, hey, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Like I keep saying, stay hydrated. Don't pass out. Uh, what else? Keep training. And if your coach puts that belt on you, it means you deserve that belt. Agreed. And yeah, I would like to point just add one thing. Self-doubt is normal. You know, whether you call it imposter syndrome or whatever, it's part of being human. So just gotta mitigate it, gotta or ignore it, and just keep moving forward and just keep training. This is focusing on long-term goals. And skill acquisition. Decline yeah. a skill or currency, whatever. I'm going to go to sleep now. All right, well, I'll see you next week. And uh, right. yeah. we should get together and beat each other up. It'll be great. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Good night, All right. everyone. See you. Bye. Night, everyone. Bye.